This was back in the late 1980s when I used to work at a mom and pop hamburger restaurant called Henry's Burgers. It wasn't the most spectacular job in the world, but hey, it was a job my uncle helped me get as he was friends with the owner. I eventually became an assistant manager, but I wanted to cover this one night that was very scary. Now, the restaurant was styled in that early 1950s look. Imagine the McDonald's brothers' vision of a perfect fast food restaurant. Wide open space, huge kitchen, with a small room for customers and tables outside with a large parking lot in the front. That was the look. Okay, so it was closing time, which for us was about 10 p.m. Myself and another co-worker, who we will call Sean, were in the process of closing and cleaning everything up. I remember we had been talking about sports or something of that nature when we started to hear the distant sound of police sirens. Another police chase? Isn't this like the second one this week? I said jokingly. Perhaps, but whatever man. Let's just finish this. I want to go see my girl. My co-worker Sean says. By the way, Sean was awesome. He was this typical guy from the hood, but he was a huge teddy bear when it came to his friends and co-workers. The dude would literally save your life from anything or anyone. Anyway, a minute or so passes and the police sirens are blaring like a megaphone to your ear. We take this opportunity to take a peek from the back kitchen and all of a sudden this masked individual is standing in our small customer lobby. He has a pistol in his hand that immediately sends chills down our spine. Dude, he's armed, what do we do? I say, sweat falling down my brow. Relax, I'm going to close the door, Sean whispers as he starts making his way over. We don't even get the chance to close it all the way because the masked man storms in and we're now face to face with him. You two, stay quiet and don't you dare move. As soon as he says that a couple of officers are just entering the premise when the dude literally fires a couple of shots towards the front window, causing them to shatter. I've got two hostages here. Don't you come any closer if you know what's good for them. Well, great. This man was holding us hostage in this room. Meanwhile, he started demanding the officers to leave. However, the place was surrounded as far as I could tell. At this point, the masked man is just panicking and pacing back and forth. Oh man, I don't want to go back, yo. I've been locked away for too long. This isn't fair, he said, as Sean and I are just standing against the back corner. All the while, there are some negotiations trying to take place, trying to get him to surrender. Look, dude, you don't want to make this any worse than it already is. Just give up. It's going to save you that much more trouble. Sean tells him with a compassionate expression. The armed man just stares over at Sean and tells us to be quiet. Meanwhile, he continues to argue with the police officers. I remember whispering to Sean, telling him how there was no way we were going to get out of this in one piece, but he told me that he did have an idea. The masked man had his back turned against us and was growing more and more irresponsible with his movements. Was he not aware that either Sean and I could disarm him? Sean Nell tells me to stay behind cover while he does something I would never forget. As the armed guy is distracted, Sean leaps at him and manages to smack the pistol out of that dude's hands. This was when in the loudest voice I could muster up, I yell, He's disarmed! Hurry, please! Since it was hard to see the officers, they were a bit skeptical. Thus, we were still sort of on our own. Sean and the masked man are wrestling as I go for the pistol and I manage to kick it underneath the deep fryer. At last, after what seemed like an eternity, Officers and a couple of SWAT come storming in and are eventually able to get us to safety. That was more or less the ending. It was a huge deal in our small town and we even got interviewed in the local newspaper. As for the guy who came storming into our restaurant, it turned out he had just robbed a small bank and had stolen a vehicle an hour earlier where he led the officers on a wild chase. That chase ending at Henry's Burgers. So... That's my scary story submission for you. I'm sure by now you've heard plenty of stories when it comes to working at video game stores. And yes, almost all of them are true. Trust me, 
This is coming from a former video game store employee. Now, with that said, does anyone remember the good old days of 2009? All aboard the hype train for Modern Warfare 2, they said. It would be the greatest installment in the series, they said. Sure, I guess you could make that argument. But along with the groundbreaking features and hype at that year's E3 conference, it also created a lot of impatience among the gaming community, mostly because there were retailers and small shops like mine that were breaking the release date and letting customers purchase early copies. Anyone who works in the video game industry knows that is a huge rule to break, and if you're caught, forget being fired, that's the least of your concern. I've heard stories about former video game store employees, heck even the managers, being hit with hefty fines. But what happens when you don't give someone a copy by choice? Rather, if you don't hand over a copy, that's it for you. You're dead. That's me putting it lightly. So where do I begin? Ah yes, I know, the store I was working at. It's a now defunct family owned video game store called Games for Plus. You go for shopping for all things retro. No, I promise that's not our slogan. Okay, maybe it is. Anyway, we sold video game consoles from the 80s and 90s. Want a Sega console with an original copy of Sonic? We got you. But don't let the nostalgia fool you. We also sold modern games and even upcoming releases as well. But the owner even threw a pizza party for about 30 people who showed up for the Super Smash Bros. Brawl release. That was fun, and I remember the tournament we threw with the grand prize winner getting $500. Sadly, I placed in third place, but I did get a free copy of the game, which was pretty sweet. Anywho, I was working that week before Modern Warfare 2 was to release, and of course we got plenty of people who came in to ask if we had the game in stock. I had to tell each of these individuals I wasn't allowed to confirm whether or not we had the game, even though it had already been there for a week. Out of about a hundred people who came in to ask, there might have been about three who yelled at me before calling me a bunch of vulgarities. But ah yes, what's this submission about? That one guy who took his video game obsession a little too far. If I remember correctly, it was three days before release date and I was on the closing shift with one other employee. I actually remember training her as I'd become an assistant manager by that point. When we were about to lock up, a man sporting full-on tattoo sleeves and tattoos on his neck and face, wearing large sunglasses, walked into our store and asked if we had Modern Warfare 2. I had to tell him it would be available in three days, and he all about loses it. I've been going to town to town and everyone has been telling me the same thing, over and over again. I'm tired of this. If you don't give me that copy, I'll take the copies by force. The employee I was training, who we will call Rebecca, was visibly shaking from the man's anger. Well, that would be the least of our concern. The man seriously takes out a handgun, and now he demands we show him to the back room, where we kept copies of the game. Rebecca let out a squeal, which angered this person. Oh, be quiet, or I'll make sure you never speak again. I try to calm the man down by telling him I'll get him some copies from the back as long as he lets Rebecca go. He insisted as we both show him to the back, most likely because he didn't want us running off to get help or calling for the police. But once we're in the back room where we keep all the extra stock, he snatches about four copies of Modern Warfare 2 before staring at Rebecca and I and stating, You two didn't see anything. If I find out that you ratted me out, I'll come back for you and I'll finish the job. He then runs out of the store and we quickly book it to phone for the police. Luckily, the man was easily recognizable and with the security footage, he was caught and arrested just a few days later. That's essentially all there was to the story. Rebecca ended up quitting, most likely from that frightful evening, which I can't really blame her. And I worked there for another six months before I left for a job at Costco, where I'm currently the manager. As for Games for Plus, it closed in late 2015 due to poor sales. It's quite sad to be honest. I miss those days. Not the one where we got robbed, but when we would have the community nights with customers. Anyone else out there have a story from working at game shops? 
it'd be great to hear in the comments section. Either way, stay safe everyone, and take care. This happened in the late 1980s when I just moved to the United States from Mexico. This puts me at roughly 23 to 24 years of age. I've been looking for work for a couple of weeks as I settled into my new life and I landed a job cleaning some offices for some car dealerships a family friend owned. As this was night work, I would sleep during the daytime and get up at around 6.30 p.m. I'd have some food, get changed, and then carpool to the first car dealership with my cousin who cleaned beside me. We will call her Veronica. Now, on a normal night beginning at 9 p.m., we would clean up to three dealerships, the office where all the business is done, the restrooms, the back room, and of course the show floor where all the cars are located. Combined, it took us about eight to nine hours, and by sunrise, we are exhausted and can't wait to head home for a quick breakfast, and then it's off to bed. Anyway, now that you get an idea of the schedule, let me tell you about this one night. We were on our second car dealership, which was two stories, and myself and Veronica were on the second floor, mopping and dusting. We both started to get hungry and thought about the lunch we had packed. However, I'd forgotten to take it out of the back seat of our car. Not really a problem, it was just a matter of going and retrieving it. I tell Veronica I'd be right back and I head to the parking lot just behind the building. This was when I first noticed something was off. For context, the car dealership was just on the outskirts of the city. This meant traffic was kept to a minimum more so at 2 in the morning. Well, considering our vehicle was the only one parked when we got here, I was somewhat surprised to see an unmarked van parked at the far end of the parking lot. Seeing this, I quickly ignored it to go and grab our lunch. Fast forward, maybe 7 to 8 minutes later, we were in the upstairs office eating some sandwiches and chips when we suddenly heard a loud crash come from the first floor. Both of us practically jump out of our seats as I go to investigate what had caused the disturbance. The windows. Yes, the lobby windows of the first floor had been completely smashed. But you know what else I could see? That van I noticed just a few minutes before in the parking lot. It was now in the lobby. I now watched as three people in all black clothing and masks storm into the car dealership and begin making their way around. I froze when I could see that they were armed with knives. Veronica, get in the office and call 911, quick, I tell her, voice shaking with panic and fear. We went ahead and moved one of the desks and a couple of the chairs to block the doorway as we start dialing 911. Here's more or less of what we said. Hello, operator. We need police here right now. Me and my cousin are working at this car dealership and some armed men just broke in. Okay, we're sending police as we speak. Can you get to a safe location and try to hide? The operator then relayed to us, to which we tell her we were already hiding. No less than a minute later, we can hear footsteps on the second floor as we hear the voice of the men as one of them instructs the other to come check the room that we were in. By now the lights were already off and were hiding behind some furniture at the far end of the office. I remember the one who was at the door jingling the door handle, complaining he was unable to get the door open. This was followed by what we assumed was kicking as the table was slowly beginning to move. I'm happy to say they didn't make it in and quickly moved on to another portion of the car dealership. Those next few moments honestly felt like an eternity. But soon enough, the operator tells us the police had just arrived, but advises us to stay locked in place. No more than five minutes later, the operator tells us it's safe to exit, and the police will be waiting for us outside. We still weren't sure, but that's until somebody knocks at the office door and says they're a police officer. We have them slide his badge under the door as a reassurance, since there is no window to look out of. Then, we exit to see two officers just standing there. We ended up calling the owner and we gave our statements to the police before we finally went home at 6am. Obviously, that dealership was closed for the next week while new windows were installed. Veronica and I have never had any sort of creepy things like this occur again. 
and after about two years of cleaning, I got a job working for a friend's insurance firm, where I'm still at today. Back from 2009 to 2011, I worked as a security guard for a small family-owned jewelry store that was owned by a really nice couple that I'm still friends with today. I was tasked simply with keeping the store guarded and helping out anytime the owners needed assistance, though that was rarely needed as the other employees took care of customers and whatnot. There was one night I wanted to discuss with all of you that really showed me how truly evil some people can be out there. I do remember it being during the winter as it had been snowing and I was wearing this heavy duty coat with snow pants and snow boots. I had been in my office, located in a little portable trailer out back behind the jewelry store and I was drinking some coffee and listening to the radio while watching the security cameras. There were five cameras in total, two at the front, one on each side of the building then one in the back, where my trailer is visible just at the very far end. All of a sudden, I started to notice this strange activity. There appeared to be an individual dressed in a hoodie, pacing back and forth and trying to open the front door. Now, as the store is located on a semi-busy street, it's pretty common to see people on tape, but they usually just walk by, and if they do look into the windows, they'll leave seeing as the store is closed. Bear in mind, it's about 1am and it's easily 20 something degrees outside. No sane individual would be caught out here unless they were crazy. Either way, I kept an eye on them for a minute or two, but they eventually leave and I start to relax thinking they could have possibly been some person from the local tavern. Fast forward to about 2am, one hour later, and I got up to stretch and decided to do a quick patrol. I grab my flashlight and my cup of coffee and step out into the snow, instantly being blasted by what seems like Antarctic air. Not even a few steps later, I began to hear meowing. I looked at the corner of my trailer and I could see one of my friends, a neighborhood stray cat who often visited me anytime I was working. She looked as if she was freezing, therefore I let her into the trailer so she could warm up and in the meantime I would be back in a few moments. This small distraction of letting the cat inside would be the beginning of my scary encounter. It had been a total of 5 minutes since I last looked at the security camera monitors, and as I approach the front of the building, I hear a loud crash that startled me out of my shoes. I went from exhausted to high alert as I make my way over to the noise, imagining only the worst. My flashlight shone upon millions of shards of broken glass and I spend a few seconds trying to determine the cause. However, it would be less than 10 seconds later that I shine my flashlight into the jewelry store and I could see what I'd feared ever since I began working here. What appears to be a burglar. Being a young 20 year old, my adrenaline took over my common senses as I rushed into the store yelling and demanding this person they had to leave. They turned around and what I saw froze me even more than the cold night ever could. I see a pistol. All I had for defense was some pepper spray. I would have stood no chance had the burglar reacted. The burglar tells me to hush and then instructs me to get closer to him, otherwise he would have shot me. I did the exact opposite. I run like a bat out of a cave and instead of going back to my trailer, I booked it across the street to a Walmart where I managed to get the attention of another security guard. We immediately phoned for the police and told them there was an armed robber inside the jewelry store and they needed to send someone quick. About 15 officers got there no more than 5 minutes later, but sadly by the time they arrived, the person had gotten away. In total, it made off with about $15,000 worth of jewelry. Quite the setback, but even though I cursed at myself for not being able to do more, Neither the police officers nor the store owners put any blame on me. In fact, they were more worried about my well-being and would have been even more concerned had something bad happened to me. Now, if there was one good ending, it's that they ended up catching and arresting the robber a month later, thanks in part to the security camera footage and my description. Also, I ended up adopting that stray cat, and she continues to live with both myself and my girlfriend.
I work inside a little convenience store on my college campus. It's located inside one of the dormitories. Funny enough, I live inside that same dormitory, so I really didn't have to go too far when it came to work. Normally, I'm there during the evenings as most of my classes are during the daytime and the afternoons. Now, I should describe this really quickly. These dormitories are the kinds where you need a key card in order to enter the building. This was mainly for safety precautions from people who might try to enter who aren't college students. Anyway, I want to take you back to one of my night shifts during finals week of last year. It was around 11pm and I was there at the front desk studying for my chemistry final and all was pretty well. Out of nowhere, a female student walks in and tells me she was witnessing something pretty strange. Apparently, there was some really crazy man outside saying all this nonsense and yelling like there was no tomorrow. I guess it did explain the noise that I was hearing. It was interesting. Does he look like a student or are they some random person? I don't know, but I called the campus police to come check it out because he's acting really strange. After this short exchange, she purchases some Chex Mix and a Dr. Pepper and then goes about her way. Fast forward a few minutes and the yelling from outside had suddenly become more audible. It almost sounded as if the man had entered the building. Sure enough, from the little store doorway that looks into the main lobby, I see two things. One, two students walking past him with a scared and worried look on their face and now this older looking man throwing a fit. He's tossing and turning and going on about some guy named Damien. I sure didn't know who Damien was, but I was pretty sure this was the crazy man my fellow college student had mentioned. I get on the phone and call campus police and I tell them there's some man inside the dormitory causing a disturbance. Hey, uh, thanks for calling. We actually received a similar call about 10 minutes ago. We sent a couple of officers to go investigate it. That's nice, but can you hurry? He's inside the building. Okay, where are you right now? I explain I was inside the little shop and I had a perfect view of what was taking place. He assures me they would be there momentarily, but right before I get off the phone, the man notices me and comes charging in while screaming. Who were you just calling? That better not have been the police. I then tell him that he needed to leave but this only angers him. I'm tired of you kids making so much noise. Anytime I try to get some sleep, it's always one of you and your loud cars and your loud music. As a quick mention, the campus was next to a neighborhood, and yes, I know what he's talking about. We do have those obnoxious college students who drive around at 3 in the morning with loud music, but why was he yelling at me for that? I couldn't even get another word out, as he, of all things, takes out a knife from his pocket and comes charging, almost going over the countertop. He was crazy. But where could I go? He was standing in front of my only exit and the only way I could leave is if I could distract him. I grab a nearby broom, hoping that this was enough to protect me, and I brace myself while huddling in the corner. Things seem to be going worse, but then I hear police officers enter the hallway. I scream for their assistance and they arrive within seconds. The man drops the knife and surrenders. And after that incident, I found out from others that the man they took in had a well-known history of going after, as well as stalking students. It also turned out that on that night, he was drunk and intoxicated. That explained why he was out of it. As for how he got in, the two students I saw walk past him had actually let him inside mistaking him for a fellow student. So anyway, that's my scary and creepy story. I've had my fair share of creepy encounters growing up, but perhaps the one that stands out from the rest was when I worked graveyards at McDonald's during my years in college. The McDonald's I was employed at was in a pretty average downtown area, nothing worth growing concerned or scared over. After all, I'd always considered myself the tough girl. I grew up in a household with three older brothers, and I pretty much became like one of the boys, if you will, whenever they'd invite me to go out with them. Needless to say, nobody ever messed with me. Anyway, back to the story at hand. I was working the graveyard shift one early morning in 2013, and it was just myself 
the cook, and the manager. The manager was in the back working on paperwork and would occasionally come to check up on us if we needed anything. Luckily, once it's past 11pm, things are pretty quiet at this 24-hour establishment. Business normally starts to pick up again at around 4am since that's when a lot of the early birds will have to go to work. Therefore, I was looking forward to just standing around and letting the money roll in, even if it was boring. Fast forward to about 2am, we had some customers here and there, but when this one man enters the McDonald's, I start getting this really bad feeling. Nothing suspicious about him at first. He walked up to the cash register and ordered himself a cup of coffee, and then he pays like normal and takes a seat at one of the tables that overlooks the front counter where I was located. Give it another 30 minutes and I notice the man is still sitting there. Kind of weird, but I didn't really mind him. It's now an hour and it's beginning to approach 3am, and he's still there. However, over this latter half, I couldn't help but notice him staring at me. He wouldn't even go out of his way to hide his intentions. You know how sometimes you catch people staring at you and they immediately look the other way? This guy was doing the complete opposite. So I start to focus my attention on the TV located by the restrooms that's playing the local news. Still no customers to speak of. Hey, what time do you get off of work? I hear a voice say. I look over my shoulders and see the man is standing there with a huge grin on his face. I'm off at 6, why do you care? I was just wondering, that's all. Is it just you and the cook? Nah, we have a manager in the back. He's a retired army veteran so you probably shouldn't mess with him. Oh, I see. Well, thanks for the food. Have a good rest of your shift. When I'd mentioned my manager and his previous line of work, it's like whatever this man was planning had suddenly come to a halt. Hey, you good girl? What was that guy asking you? The co-worker of mine who is in the back, who we will call Jamie, walks over to me and says, Nah, he was just asking about if we had the McRib, nothing really to note. Remember I mentioned at the beginning I had grown up with three older brothers, therefore I was accustomed to handling situations such as these. I don't let myself become the target. Fast forward a few days later and I'm returning from some time off. The guy, the one who ordered the coffee, ended up showing up again and he proceeds to do the same thing. This time, thankfully, there are some other customers and I have another cashier keeping me company as we were a little bit busier. Unfortunately, he was only going to stay for another 30 minutes as he was off at 1. What do you know? Mr. Creep decides to stick around until after my co-worker left. As soon as he leaves, I saw the guy get up and start walking over to the cash register. Hey, Maria, you need anything? I hear my manager speak to me as he starts making his way out from the back office. Yeah, actually, do you mind if we talk? I got a little problem I want to discuss with you. No joke, the dude does a complete 180 and walks out of the McDonald's. I pretty much told my manager that man was giving me bad vibes and that we should keep an eye out for him. Fast forward another month and I haven't seen that man anymore. At this point, I assumed I'd given him enough of a good scare, but he decided to hopefully move on to a more positive thing. I was on my break having myself a smoke in the parking lot when all of a sudden someone approaches me with a hoodie covering their face. Hey, what's up man? Shut up and do as I say. I looked down for a brief moment and I could see a knife. Now I've taken some self-defense courses before and the way this person was positioned along with how they were holding their knife was just asking me to disarm him and how quickly I was able to do just that. He's left astonished as I finally am able to get a better look at who this person might be. You guessed it, the same man who had been watching me that very first night. He takes off instantly and I book it back into the McDonald's where I immediately grabbed the attention of my manager who was talking to a customer. In summary, we ended up contacting the local authorities, but the man they were looking for had sadly gotten away. He never did return, at least that I am aware of, since I put in my two weeks immediately after that night and didn't even bother showing up to work, which my manager was actually very supportive of. Life has since moved on since that incident. I am now married and live across the country with a baby girl on the way in March of 2021. 
If I can give some advice to all of you listening, my best recommendation, actually scratch that, something you should do no matter what, is attend self-defense courses. Chances are you may never have to use any of those techniques you'll learn, but it's better having that knowledge just in case the situation arises. So this happened quite some time ago and I wanted to talk about it today since it's never left my mind. It was around 1997 and I just started working at a gas station in Guadalajara, Mexico. For reference, I'm male and I was 19 years old. The pay was really bad, but my friend had got me the job so I gladly accepted it. Training lasted for three days and then on the fourth day I was thrown out there on my own. Apart from making a few minor mistakes, the owner was comfortable with leaving me on my own by the end of the second work week. And thus that's where I want to take you to. Week 3 on a random weekday night. My work shift that evening was 10pm to 6am and I just bumped out my co-worker Carlos. Once Carlos had left, I tended to the customers who slowly started to disappear by the time it was midnight. Nothing too exciting happened for the next few hours or so, so I took the time to clean and watch the little TV we had. At around 3.30 in the morning, I watch a beat up minivan pull up into the parking lot. I then notice a man walk out but then go back to watching the TV. 20 seconds later, I greet the man who appeared like any other average customer. He walks around the store for a while and I go to organizing the newspapers on the front countertop. As I'm doing this activity, I suddenly feel something on my back and then a man whispers to me. Now obviously this was in Spanish, but I'll write it out in English to my best recollection. Don't you dare move or make any sudden movements. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to head to the cash register and you're going to give me all the money that's inside. I couldn't believe it. This store, or should I say, gas station, was being robbed. What could I do but comply with this man's orders? I do as he says, with my hands up and I start to walk back behind the front counter, all the while trying to hold back tears. All I could really think about was my family. What if this was it, and I never saw them again? That was the first time in my life I felt genuine fear. So I finally turn around and this is when I'm finally able to get my eyes on the firearm. He now has it pointed directly at my face. Hurry up, I don't have much time. I open the cash register and start putting what little money was inside into the man's backpack. In total, there was about the equivalent of 300 US dollars. Apparently this wasn't enough to satisfy his greediness and he now demands to know if there was a safe where there was even more money. There actually was, but it was in the back room. Fearing he could shoot me at any time if I don't tell him the truth, I reveal the location of the safe and he has me take him to the back room. After about 30 seconds of fiddling around with a lock, he pushes me to the side and grabs all he could. This could have been my opportunity to book it, but I feared there may have been an accomplice waiting outside to take me out. It turned out that there was. Anyway, once he takes all the money, he has the audacity to wish me a great night before leaving me with one final message. Pop. He fires a gunshot and manages to hit the coffee maker just a few inches from my face. He then takes off running and I peek around the corner of the back room. Sure enough, someone was waiting for him and they take off into the minivan. To say I was scared was an understatement of the century. I didn't know how to feel. I remember falling to my knees, shaking and crying. I was happy to be alive, but I was so fearful that they might return and end up killing me. After a couple of minutes, I regained my composure and I finally called the police. And they got there about 15 minutes later, but by then the two who had robbed me were now long gone. Sadly, our store didn't have security cameras for whatever dumb reason. So the only thing I could do was work with the police and a sketch artist. To this day, the two who showed up that night have never been brought to justice. In the mid-2000s, back in high school, I used to babysit on the weekends as a part-time job for a really nice family that lived down the road from me. The couple, who at the time were in their late 30s, had two daughters who were aged 8 and 5 respectively. 
What I enjoyed the most about babysitting for that family was they always treated me like I was their daughter, making me food, inviting me to their parties and get-togethers, and they were even nice enough to give me a thousand dollars along with a really nice card when I graduated from college years later. I still talk to them all these years later, and I'm good friends with the kids too. Well, not kids anymore, but you get the basic premise, even though I have since moved out of state. Anyway though, not a typical night shift story. Let's say if I were at a store or any other job. But this did occur in the evening, and while I was working slash babysitting, so I guess it still counts as a night shift story. So there I was, in my room, watching TV and eating snacks, when I got a call from the family asking if I could come over and babysit the kids the next day, as well as spend the night. The reasoning was as some close friends of theirs had invited the pair to a casino slash hotel that was a couple of hours away as they had free rooms, and they really wanted to go since they hadn't seen those friends in so long. Naturally, this meant they needed me, so without hesitation, I agreed and the plans were set. The next afternoon, close to 3 p.m., I walked down the street and got greeted by the kids coming up to me and giving me a huge hug. The mom and dad thanked me again for being able to come over last minute, and I told them it wasn't really a problem since I had no other plans. With the introductions out of the way, they invited me in and we had some pizza from Domino's. Before an hour later, mom and dad leave and it's just myself and the kids. Nothing extraordinary happens in the next few hours. Just me playing with the kids in the backyard and going into the front and drawing with the chalk on the driveway. I'd say close to about 7pm. I noticed something a little bit strange, which at first I just wrote off as my paranoia. A black SUV drove down the street very slowly and then ended up stopping straight across from us. Bear in mind, they never did turn the car off. The car was running the entire time. Though to be fair, this was in the summertime so I assumed they just had the air conditioning on and didn't want to worry about the heat. Anyway, 10 minutes passed and I never saw anybody get out, which for some reason raised some serious alarms in my head. Guess that's what happens when you watch so many scary movies. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the car drives away, and I write the whole incident off as just some person going out for an afternoon drive and stopping to take a break. Yeah, not exactly the best explanation, but it's what I came up with. Fast forward to around 10pm and the kids are just about ready to head into the rooms and get some shut-eye. We were in the living room, minding our own business, watching some Spongebob on DVD, and this is when the kids asked me if I could make them some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I happily agreed considering I wanted to make something as well as I still wasn't sleepy and I was getting pretty hungry. I head into the kitchen as the kids lay on the couch, and while I'm at the sink, I just so happen to look out into the kitchen window that overlooks the front yard. What I noticed was that same black SUV from a few hours ago, as it's now parked directly across the street from me. Again, I never saw anyone get out, and I actually joked to myself that they were staking out the house and getting ready to go on a burglarizing rampage. Hey, I can't be the only one who tries to make light of creepy and bizarre situations, right? It's sort of our brain's way of dealing with stress. Nonetheless, I prepare the sandwiches, and about three minutes later I look back out the window. The black SUV is gone. Huh. Well, that's weird. Once again, we fast forward a few hours later. I'm finally starting to get sleepy, and I'm on the couch watching Adult Swim at about 1am. This is when I heard a strange noise coming from one of the back rooms. I'll tell you, that house echoed like you were in some sort of cave, which was why I heard these audible cues sounds of scratching and something moving. I thought perhaps the kids had woken up and must have been playing, so I sighed and start heading to their room to go check. A quick side note, I haven't mentioned this yet, but this is a two-story house and the kids room is on the second floor. I promise this is important to my retelling. Anyway, when I get to their room, they're fast asleep and the noises aren't stopping from downstairs. I'm starting to get a bit creeped out, so I peek into the hallway, and it's at this moment my body goes cold. I hear a door opening very slowly. 
I don't know how I kept my composure or how I didn't scream, but my number one concern was now that somebody had just broken in. Instinctively, I locked the door and then took out my cell phone to dial 911. Now here's the thing, as I'm explaining the situation, I ended up peeking out through the kid's window. It also overlooks the front yard and the driveway. I'm shocked to see that same black SUV is parked in front of the house. It's at this moment the harsh reality of my joke hits me. This house is getting burglarized. Now I'm stuck in this room with the kiddos who are fast asleep. Dare I wake them up and startle them, thus notifying these intruders? Even if I don't, they're going to try opening the bedroom door, and who knows what they'll do at that moment. Best scenario, they give up and move on with their burglar spree. Worst scenario, they kick the door down. From there, who knows? I chose the harsh reality, telling them there are some people inside the house, but for no reason whatsoever were they to make a single noise or scream and yell. How I had to try so hard to tell them this news, withholding the most straight face I could possibly muster. Fast forward about a minute and we hear the sounds of footsteps making their way up the stairs. I beg the dispatch lady on the phone for cops to get here as she confirms they're already on the way and that we are to remain calm. Easy for her to say, but to be fair, we're the ones that are here. In what was an absolute miracle, we see red and blue lights flashing through the windows just moments later as the door handle of the bedroom begins to violently shake. I hold back tears and the kids are looking up at me through the closet that I told them to hide in as something comes over me and I decide to open the window. Police! Help! Someone's in the house! The door handle stops and I hear two people whispering something along the lines of, They called the police? Quick, run! Police officers manage to catch the two just as they're running out the back door and we ended up finding out they were actually pretty young and inexperienced some guys in their early 20s. What made things scarier was that one of the burglars had a BB gun and the other had a knife. Safe to say I was very thankful for those police officers who told me they were already in the area doing an evening patrol when they got the call. That explained their record arrival. Anyway, I called the parents to explain what had happened and they drove back almost immediately, arriving within an hour and a half. Now, the thanks was given to me, and they couldn't stop saying how I was a hero for keeping their little ones safe. So that pretty much brings it close to my submission. To clear some things up, the burglars are broken in through a back door, which unfortunately had problems closing properly. Not that I should have been having to worry about that. I mean, why should anyone have to worry about the potential of getting robbed and having people break into a house? No one. Not even my worst enemy should have to experience something like this, wouldn't you agree? This also occurred in a very safe neighborhood where crime was almost never heard of. Oh, and yes, that black SUV? That belonged to those home burglars. And as I mentioned prior saying that it was an important detail, we were on the second floor. So it's not like we could have gone out the window, as there was no cushioning our fall. This was back in the early 2000s and I used to work at a mom and pop video rental store. Think of Blockbuster, but smaller. This takes place in northern Pennsylvania if it's anything important to anyone. Also, I'm female and I was 18. Anyway, it was just a summer job as I quit after three months to focus on college. It did teach me quite a bit, especially when it came to dealing with creeps. Let me take you back to one of these scary situations. It's going to span a series of weeks. So, I was working the night shift, and it was around 10.30pm and I had about 20 minutes until closing. I was organizing some of the new releases, and an average looking man who looks in his early 30s walks in with a smile. I greet him, and he says hello back to me. I then go through my typical spiel, and he says he wanted to rent a couple of movies. No problem. I tell him he's free to browse, but that I would need him to leave in about 10 minutes because I was closing shop. Fast forward about 3 minutes and he still hasn't come back. Assuming he had trouble finding a movie, I get up from my chair and try to find him. 
This is when I see a flash in between the movies on the shelf, followed by him cursing. I stood there for a second. I turned the corner of the aisle and he has one of those disposable cameras. Excuse me, but were you taking pictures of me? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I was just taking pictures of the movies in front of me. The joke was on him. The shelf was empty. All it had were those little papers that show the title of the movie, but no VHS case. Really? Then maybe you can point out which movie because I don't see any in front of me. He gets really nervous and without saying anything else, he walks out of the store. Really strange, but I guess just some random creeper. Fast forward a week and I was once again closing the store. I had finally put everything away and I was on the inside just about to lock the front door and that's when I see a man approaching. The funny part was that he held something behind his back. It was a bit confusing. Wait, hold on a minute, don't leave yet. I look and I remember him. It was the same guy from a week ago, the one with the disposable camera. I'm sorry, but we're closed. If you're looking to rent something, you're going to have to come back tomorrow. I don't want to rent a movie, but I don't mind renting you. Excuse me? I was confused, but then he reveals what he had been hiding. A crowbar. He proceeds to smack the front glass door. It took him a couple of swings, but he manages to break the glass, which by that point I'd already hit the alarm and run to the back of the store. This man was out of it, and for whatever reason he was out to get me. I knew that if I could lock myself in the back room for long enough, the police would arrive. This was something I kept telling him as he kept kicking at the back door. Come on, let me inside. That was not going to happen. Finally, after a couple of minutes, he takes off, but thankfully I was in luck. A nearby security guard had heard the alarm go off from across the street and had come over to investigate. He was able to wrestle the dude and subdue him until a police officer showed up. He was eventually taken in, and he even eventually confessed that he had an obsession with me, saying that it was love at first sight. In his van, they found a bunch of pictures that appear to be taken from inside the video rental store. Not only that, but pictures that were taken from a distance, and I was in them. Definitely creepy, but that's now in my past. Just thought I'd share it with you so the creepy fox could feature it on one of his future episodes for all of you to listen to. I work at a grocery store in the Pacific Northwest. The only reason I'm not revealing the name of the store is for privacy reasons, so I hope you'll understand. That doesn't mean I'll leave any details out of what happened. Now, the city I live in isn't exactly the greatest, but it's not the worst either. The only reason I give it that bad label is because for whatever reason, we've been getting a lot of weirdos. I'm talking about the drug users. I'm pretty sure you know what I mean by that. We've had a deal with needles being left outside and even empty bottles around the premise, and we even had this one time where one of them tried to break into the store. I wasn't working that night, but apparently it wasn't too big of a deal. Anyway. On this evening, I was outside cleaning and pushing the shopping carts, and all was going well. At one point, I actually helped out a lost child, and I was able to reunite him with his mom, so that was really nice. However, not even that act of kindness would prepare me for the creepy encounter I had. So it's almost closing time, and myself and another co-worker, who we will call Timothy, were getting all the shopping carts and pushing them to the front of the store. It seemed as if we had all of them, but while scanning the parking lot, I was able to see one peeking out from behind a car. Timothy offers to go grab it, but I tell him I would go take care of it. What could go wrong? So there I am, peacefully walking over. All I was able to think about was the pizza I was going to buy to reward myself after a long work week. Once I arrive at the vehicle, I see two things. The shopping cart and a homeless man drinking. He sees me and he says hello and I greet him back thinking nothing else. However, when trying to pull the shopping cart away, he pulls it back and gets angry. The conversation goes something like this. Hey, that's mine. Give it back. I'm sorry, but this shopping cart belongs to this store. 
Fine, whatever. Hey, do you have any money you can lend by any chance? Sorry, I don't have anything. He then looks me up and down for about 10 seconds and says, Never mind, I think you'll do. I laugh in confusion as I once again tell him I needed the shopping cart. He gets up, stumbles through something in his pocket for a few seconds, and then he takes out a switchblade. He starts walking toward me now with a creepy smile and I took this as my opportunity to run. He gives chase as I scream out to Timothy, who was talking to one of the nearby security guards. They both see me and they immediately jump into action. However, seeing the sight of these two football sized co-workers of mine, this creep does a complete 180 and now it's him running away. That was pretty much all there was to it. It's been about a week and we haven't seen him. As an update, I did describe the man to the police and they said they would keep a lookout. Not sure who he was, but I'm sure he thought that he could get an easy catch so to speak, but that didn't happen. I'm a retired bus driver who now spends his days looking after his grandchildren and relaxing on the backyard porch, watching my bird feeder and listening to music. One thing I discovered was your Creepy Fox channel, and as someone who enjoys scary stories, I thought I'd write up one of my crazier experiences that I had when I was younger. We're going to rewind all the way back to the late 1980s when I was a young college student. I had been in need of money really badly and I landed a job working as a bus driver after my dad's friend had recommended it to me one day. But little was I to know that would be a summer job that would be an entire career. To say I love driving would be an understatement. Anyway, this was about six months into the job and by that point I'd already gotten used to long hours as I worked in the evenings. Seeing as I worked in downtown Los Angeles, I saw many different crowds of individuals. Such was one person in particular that to this day I will never forget. So it was about 11 at night and I was making the rounds near LAX airport, picking up passengers left and right and enjoying a cool autumn's evening. The bus was a solid 70% capacity and almost everyone from what I recall was sitting quietly either looking out the window or reading a book. It was nice and relaxing, until I reached a certain bus stop, one that was next to a Chevron gas station. I remember by that point, let's say midnight now, the bus capacity had dropped to about 10%. So anyway, I recall picking up two guests, a woman in her early 30s and another man who appeared to be homeless. But here's the thing, as the woman approached me to pay, she whispered to me that the homeless man had been following her for the last little while and she was hoping I would say or do something. As I hadn't actually seen anything taking place, there wasn't much I could really do, so I told her just to take a seat behind me and I'll make sure to keep an eye on her. Besides, I also assumed since there were a few people on the bus, this man wouldn't try anything. Remember, this was a time before cell phones were available to the general public so even if I wanted to, I couldn't call the cops to check up on the man. Yeah, for those of you who weren't around before cell phones, life was very different. Not that I should have to really tell you. At any rate, the bus ride goes unhinged for the next 20 minutes and more and more passengers are now leaving. All that's left by this point is the woman I mentioned and the homeless man who was sitting at the very back of the bus. The good news was it appeared as if whatever was going on between the two was no longer an issue. However, I was too soon to write him off because just as we had arrived at the woman's stop, I heard her scream at the top of her lungs. For those few seconds that I looked away, I looked back up at the mirror to see the man grab the woman's purse and then he starts to book it to the back door. I have no idea what came over me in that moment, but it's like adrenaline just suddenly took over. I quickly jump out the bus and start to give chase to the man, who was running across the street into an empty Walmart parking lot. I managed to tackle the man to the ground and grab the woman's purse. But it's when I get up, the whole situation turns downright terrifying. He pulls out a knife from his boot and then tells me to hand over the purse. I'll admit, this was one of the scariest moments of my life and I thought to myself that if I already come this far, I wasn't going to let this creep get away. But what am I going to do? 
I chose to run. And yes, there will be one person out there that will say, why did you run away, you big chicken? I don't know. You come face to face with a crazed man with a knife and tell me what you think you're going to do. Anyway, I'm running back to the bus where the woman is staring at me from the window and I'm desperately trying to yell at her to run away, but I guess she was so frozen in fear she stood in place. I was expecting a fight on my hands. However, when I looked back for a brief moment, I saw the man no longer gave chase to me. He just stood in the parking lot staring at me with a complete look of anger. I don't know what happened in those moments, but it's like something must have clicked in his head. Something like, maybe this isn't worth getting arrested for. Because that was it. I locked the doors and then end up driving the woman a few streets down closer to where I knew there was a police station. This was one of the benefits of being a bus driver. You learn pretty quickly where all the major landmarks are. In short summary, the police officers ended up driving the woman home and we did give our statements before I returned back to the main bus station to report everything to my higher ups. As far as I know, he was never caught and I never saw the man again. I don't know where that woman is today, but if there for whatever reason is a small chance she listens to these stories videos here on the Creepy Fox or someone she knows listens, then I just want to relay the message that if you remember me, then I hope you're doing well. Thanks for sharing my story. I've been working at Taco Bell for about three months, and while I sometimes get the weirdos that stare at me, nothing really seemed to escalate. After all, it seemed I was the only one to have to deal with these so-called secret admirers. Not that I would call them that, but you get the basic structure. However, even though I mentioned this, a few weeks ago I did have one encounter that has left me a bit uncomfortable and unnerved. Not because of the things he did, but not knowing whether or not he will show up again. Let's begin. There I was, 1.30am, half an hour before closing. I work in the drive through window and most of the people who showed up that late in the evening were college students and people who worked in the evenings. So all is quiet until eventually I look into the camera and I see a Ford Fusion parked at the outside menu. Hello, welcome to Taco Bell. How may I take your order? I hear someone grumbling and thus I tell the person on the other end to speak up. I'm sorry, I couldn't catch that. Could you go ahead and repeat what you said? They speak louder and ended up ordering a couple of steak chalupas. I then tell them to pull up to the next window where I would give them their order. So far, so good. Moments later, the Ford Fusion parks outside my window and I could see a man in the driver's seat. He was older, around 50 years old, with grey hair, a beard and glasses. He really looked like one of my college professors. Hello there, just give us a second and we'll get your food going. While I told him these details, I couldn't help but get this really strange feeling. I'm not sure if it's just me, but anyone else get the chills when you know something is wrong? But that's how I was feeling, and for good reason. While I stood there, he started a conversation with me. It more or less goes something like this. How's your evening going, miss? Hope you've had a good night so far. Yeah, it's been good. I'm just really exhausted. I can't wait to get home and get some rest. Oh, is that so? What time do you get off at? In a little while. When is a little while? 20 minutes? An hour? I really didn't feel like giving him proper answers, but he kept on insisting. It was starting to get a bit uncomfortable, and I kept wondering what was taking the chalupa so long. Finally, after a minute, I'm able to give him his order, and I expect him to end up leaving. However, he just sits there in his car and stares at me. I'm sorry, sir, but is there something wrong with your order? No, nothing. But I was just wondering. You seem pretty nice. Perhaps you'd like to hang out after you get off of work? Maybe you need a ride home? Just so you get one thing straight. I'm 19 years old, female, and this 50-something year old who could have easily have been mistaken for my dad kept on insisting that I spend time with him. I sure didn't want to do anything with him, and my manager could tell something was off. He walks over to me, seeing me visibly shaking, and he now takes over. Excuse me, sir, but is there anything else we can help you with? I was just talking to my niece. I am her uncle. 
were just catching up. The absolute nerve. Now he was pretending to be something he was not. My manager didn't fall for it and tells him he needs to leave now, which he finally does. Honestly, that should have been it. But it was going to get worse. Fast forward about 45 minutes later and it's time to go home, get in the car, and drive away. Oh wait, that's right. There's only one problem. I have no car. In fact, I took my bicycle to get to work. I really didn't mind this since I have a taser and my neighborhood is relatively safe. But considering the creep I talked to was making me a bit scared, I was a bit on the edge. Anyway, as soon as I get on my bicycle and begin riding away, I start to feel like I'm being followed. Sure enough, I stop for a brief moment and I take a look behind me. Same Ford Fusion from the drive through is following close. I knew it was him, so I started to pedal faster. It wasn't until I reached an intersection he ended up cutting me off, and then he rolled down his window and said, Hey, beautiful. Do you need a ride back home? Or maybe you want to go back home with me? I was so angry that I tried pedaling past him, but he ends up almost hitting me, causing me to fall back. Then, all of a sudden, he takes off. I was so scared and hurt. But luckily a nearby driver saw the action and drove up to me wanting to know if I was okay. I told her I was, apart from the few scratches, and she then offers to call the police. She does, and she keeps me company until they arrive about 10 minutes later. Unfortunately, even with all the information I had given them, he's still at large. Maybe he thought it was better not to risk getting caught, or maybe he's just waiting for his opportunity to act again. I'm not too sure, but you bet I'll keep you updated and in the loop and I'll submit any updates as they come. But for now, that's all I have. Thanks for hearing me out. I work for an authentic Mexican taqueria that's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week in Southern California. We're located near the downtown area, which means on the weekends, when I work at night. We often get the drunks who come in to get food, though quite often than not, they're more hilarious than they are aggressive. There was this one time I was working and a customer came in and yelled at my co-worker in a drunken state, claiming he was sleeping with his girlfriend, but it quickly de-escalated when a couple of his friends managed to get him to calm down. Crazy enough, the same guy came in the next day and apologized to my co-worker, which is something you almost never see or hear of. So. Anyway, I'm riding in to go over a wild encounter I had just a few months ago when I was working the night shift. That evening had been fairly busy when I first clocked in at about 9pm. Customers were arriving in large groups to get their food game on and I was happily helping making tacos along with my two other co-workers who we will call Kevin and Carlos. Now as it was approaching 2 in the morning it was time for my lunch. So I decided to head to my car, parked in the back of the building, to eat some tacos de lengua I had prepared myself, and to watch an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh, which I was re-watching for like the fifth time on my phone. I actually remember which episode I was watching. It was the one where Merrick had mind controlled Joey and he was dueling Yugi with that anchor high above them. Anyway, that's not too important. Halfway through the episode, downing the tacos with some ice cold fresh horchata, I hear a bump on the passenger side window. I was so focused on my phone that I actually jumped up scared like a little kid when I heard the noises. Standing there was a tall skinny man with no shirt on whatsoever and the scruffiest beard I'd ever seen. His hair was all nappy and it looked as if he hadn't showered in many weeks. I remember making a hand gesture like I was waving at him while letting out a nervous chuckle thinking perhaps he was going to leave me alone once he saw the car was occupied, but he continues to stand there. Well, great, so much for enjoying my food and this episode. As I'm sitting there thinking about what I'm going to do next, he then attempts to open the door, but as you'd expect, it's locked. Try and try as he did, he then moves on to the two back doors, but he is unsuccessful. Well, great, what was this guy's problem? Bang. Bang. I hear at the back bumper as my car then begins to move. 
Oh, no way was he hitting my car. I looked through the rearview mirror and sure enough he was kicking at it. I got so furious that just as I'm about to reach for the door to open it, I saw something that sent a chill down my spine. The crazed man had taken out his small knife and was beginning to slash my tires. Can't tell you how scared I got in that moment as panic starts to induce a sort of frozen state of mind where for whatever reason I just couldn't move. I don't really know how to best explain it, so let me just say that unless you're in a situation such as this, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. After sitting there frozen in what felt like hours, I decided to call my co-workers who were inside the restaurant. They didn't answer, not that I was surprised. Yes, I did end up calling the cops right after that, but as I was waiting, the man kept banging at my door saying that if I didn't open up, he would get in by force and take the car away from me. Yeah, I did tell you he was pretty out there, wasn't he? Thankfully, as he begins to walk away from me, presumably now giving up, two police cruisers pull up into the parking lot and then I notice the man takes off running. This was when I stepped out of my vehicle and told the police officers that that was the man who was trying to break into my car with a knife. Fast forward about 5 minutes later and they're bringing the man back to the parking lot in handcuffs. By this point, everyone inside the restaurant had come out to see what the commotion was about. Since mind you, at the time, there was only one customer eating and then my two co-workers who had no clue as to what was happening. At the end of it all, he was taken away and I sighed a breath of fresh air knowing that my ordeal had finally come to an end. A few days later, I uncovered that the man was well known in the downtown area for being a druggie and just so happened to have stumbled into our neck of the woods on that evening. Why he was trying to break into my car as I was eating, I guess whatever he was on had told him to do so, but luckily he was unsuccessful. I'm still working there today, but I haven't had anything crazy like this happen to me again. But hey, if I have another story to share in the future, I'll make sure to send it your way, Creepy Fox, since you're my favorite narrator. For now, Take care and be well. Back in the early 2000s, I used to work at a mom and pop video game store that also doubled as a small arcade. We mainly sold vintage video games, classics from the 80s and 90s, but that didn't mean we didn't sell some more recent releases too. It's just our theme was more focused on being vintage. Anyway, in the time working there, I had all sorts of guests. 99% had been wonderful and I actually got to know some of them very well. I would actually show up on my days off from work and those new friends I met would join me as we played at some of the arcade machines. But those are just some normal moments. I want to spend some of my time here to tell you about a situation that occurred one evening when I was working the night shift. Now, our store was located in our city's downtown, filled with many restaurants, coffee shops, bars, and stores. And while foot traffic was relatively busy, this night was really slow. I think it had to do with the fact that it had been raining pretty heavily. Combine that with the wind and nobody wanted to be out. No issue for myself and my co-worker Jennifer since this gave us plenty of time to just sit back, play games and listen to the music over the intercom system. About an hour before closing, Jennifer heads into the back room to take her break which left me all alone in the front keeping a watchful eye on the store. There were two teenagers playing Street Fighter in the arcade section, having a good time. As I looked down at the computer monitor for just a brief moment, I happened to hear somebody enter the store. I looked up to greet them and I get the chills when I'm face to face with a person wearing a ski mask and dressed in all black. I try to play it cool, asking him if he was playing some sort of prank. But this is until he starts to walk up to the shelves and starts dumping video games and other expensive products into a fairly large duffel bag. Naturally, I'm growing furious since this guy had no right to just come in and start stealing everything. I walk up to him with a purpose and I tell him he needs to stop and what he does and says next left me completely terrified. He pulls out a gun and points it right up to my temple. My life flashed before my very own eyes, 
as I feared that was going to be my end. Meanwhile, I can see behind me the two teenagers book it out of the arcade and out of the store. Not that I could really blame them, to be honest. Go open the cash register, or you're going to get shot, he says in an intimidating voice. Well, what else was I going to do? My life wasn't worth a couple of video games, even though I was pretty angry. I do as he says, and now we make our way to the cash register, while he then throws some more products into his duffel bag. I ended up pressing the silent alarm under the counter that the owner had installed for emergencies to notify the local police department, and I'm so glad I did that. Now, little did I know that in these moments, my co-worker was in the process of calling the police as well, as she had overheard and peeked from the back room to what was taking place. I don't blame her for not trying to come out and get involved. After all, last thing I wanted was for her to get hurt, and it turned out better anyway. So after he took about $500 from the cash register, he then gets even more greedy and grabs even more video games. All this time he was taking was working against his favor because it allowed enough eyewitnesses who were curious to what was happening to look out from the window and end up reporting it. Now even though police hadn't arrived first, I did get some help. You see, it turned out those two teenagers went to get some help. As it so happened, those kids were the sons of a now-retired Marine who was with his wife next door at one of the restaurants. The teenagers just so happened to have been over here. Well, that retired Marine, bless his heart, ran over to the store. And no joke, the balls of steel on this guy. He actually chased after the guy and managed to help the police get a description. Thank God that he wasn't shot and the police actually managed to catch up with a thief and arrest him. As it turned out, the gun was a fake, and in no way was I ever in any sort of danger. That was a relief, but it sure didn't mean I wasn't paranoid and traumatized for months to come. I mean, fake or not, having something like that happen to you really takes a toll on you and makes you appreciate life that much more. Imagine your first week at work going from fun to downright frightening. That's what I found myself dealing with a couple of months ago. For background, I'm female, 18 years old, and I started working at a CVS pharmacy as a part-time job to earn some extra money. Seeing as this was my first ever job, there was a bit of a learning curve, but I picked it up after a couple of days of training. This occurred on my fifth night of working there. I was working the night shift and it was myself and my fellow co-worker, who we will call Brian. Brian had been working here for the past two years and he was the assistant manager, so thankfully he kept me company. Luckily this night was fairly quiet and this evening I was helping serve ice cream in our little thrifty ice cream station. I want to say the time was close to 10 p.m. And I was cleaning the counter, and this is when an older man steps into the store. I would describe him as in his mid-thirties with dirty blonde hair, a beard, and some pretty torn up clothing. He looked homeless, but I didn't want to assume. Anyway, Brian greets him from the cash register, but he ignores him and heads down an aisle. Whatever, some guests just want to be in and out. I noticed him too, but then I got about my business. Fast forward about 15 minutes and Brian is in the restroom. It's now I started to realize I hadn't seen the man who entered for quite a while. Thus I make my way down the chips and soda aisle until I arrive at the refrigerators. I kid you not, there he is sitting down nice and comfortably like a king treating himself to some Coronas. I was pretty angry and so I walk over and I tell him, excuse me but you do realize you gotta pay for that. He ignores me and continues his drinking fest. You really need to stop that. Those aren't yours. He then interrupts me with the angriest response I've ever heard. Oh yeah, and what's a girl like you gonna do about it? Now, I'm this pretty short and shy skinny girl with glasses, but that still didn't mean I wasn't going to deal with him. Bear in mind, the guy probably outweighs me by over 100 pounds and was easily 6 foot 3. Anyway, I grab one of the bottles and put it in the refrigerator, and this angers him to get up and then push me, which causes me to fall to the ground. I ended up getting a nasty bruise on my elbow, but that was going to be the least of my concerns. 
I'm tired of you telling me what to do. That's it. The creep takes out a pocket knife and starts stumbling over to me while tipping over a Twinkies display. Suddenly all the adrenaline came pumping into me and I knew I had to get out of this situation and fast. With no way of getting to my pepper spray which was in my locker, I had no choice but to run. And that's what I do. I start making my way over to the front of the store and that's where I see two things. One, Brian just returning back to his station. And two, what looks to be like a couple of police officers entering the store. In case you're wondering, they most likely didn't hear this scuffle because this store is big and there was music playing. Anyway, I don't know what it was, but I think Lady Luck was on my side because I basically fly into the arms of these police officers. They are confused, but that's until they see this mess of a man stumbling down the aisle with the knife. The man freezes and the officers tell him to drop the knife. He does after about 10 seconds of an intense stare down, but before they could approach him, he takes off running and the two chase after him. The chase only lasts about 15 seconds, and once they get him in handcuffs, I give the police my statement. That was pretty much it. And like I mentioned, apart from the bruise and the cleanup we had to do, I was just lucky that none of us were seriously harmed. I used to have a job working at a 24 hour donut shop that was two blocks away from my house. This was during the summer of 2011 and was in the period between high school graduation and my first semester at community college. So I was 18 years of age. I worked in the evening since I tend to be a night owl anyway, and besides most of my friends had already moved out to pursue their adulthood and priorities, so it's not like I had anything else going on at the time. Now I lived in an average middle American boring town of like 3000 people, and apart from hearing about a neighbor's farm animal getting out, you didn't really hear about many notable stories, let alone any crime. Anyway, there I was on a random weekday and it's around 2 in the morning. Feeling me that evening was my typical combination of donut shop coffee and chocolate sprinkled donut, which quickly went from a sugar rush to a not so sugar rush as I sat there bored looking at my phone and watching highlights from the previous evening's Monday Night Raw. Anyone else here a wrestling fan who remembers the 2011 Summer of Punk? That promo though, hasn't really been anything like it in a while. I digress. I noticed a figure walk by the front entrance of the donut shop that looked in for about 5 seconds before stumbling back into the parking lot in the night. I wasn't really able to get a good look at the person, but judging from what I had gathered, they were wearing a dark red hoodie and ripped blue jeans, appeared to be male, tall and skinny, with a gray beard as well. It wasn't too uncommon to get customers at that hour. But the ones I did were usually police officers or truck drivers, as my neck of the woods is a well-known rest town as well. Anyway, I ignored him as just some random homeless man and I continued looking at my phone and grabbing myself another donut. I want to say 30 minutes later, I went into the restroom to pee as I had too much coffee. And while I'm in there, I heard the sound of the little bell at the front door ring. I dreaded it being a customer as I was enjoying my evening of doing nothing and stuffing myself with complimentary greasy goodness. With my hands firmly washed and a splash of cold water in the face to wake me up, I put my hand on the door handle and instantly got the chills go down my spine. I know a lot of times people use that phrase, and it is very cliche, but it's so true. It's like for some reason your body's sixth sense kicks in warning you of possible immediate danger, and if you don't get out of the area, you're pretty much a goner. I shrugged off these feelings and step into the lobby. This is only to be surprised by what I see. Remember that hooded figure I mentioned from just a little while ago? He's reaching over the counter and he's trying to grab donuts, all without paying. How dare he? I mean, sure, they're just donuts at the end of the day. But considering there is CCTV, the owner wouldn't be too happy seeing some random customer trying to feast on this delicious goodness. I raised my voice, like an edgy teenager would, and told the man to back off, further explaining he had to pay for those donuts, otherwise I was going to call the police. The man turns toward me and this is when I get a better look at him. 
His eyes are bloodshot. He's got this look across his face like he's about to go on a rampage and his movement was very bizarre. Something you might see from somebody who is on drugs. Without getting another word out, the man suddenly screams and shouts, flopping his arms around like one of those inflatable cartoon balloons you see at car dealerships. Before, I kid you not, pulling out a knife and then making the motion at his neck indicating he wanted to slash my neck. Freaked out and about to have a panic attack, my legs get a mind of their own as I quickly book it into the back, into the restroom, almost shutting the door right on the creep's hands in the process. What proceeds to follow is about three minutes of the man kicking, screaming, telling me how he was going to kill me, all the while I'm on the phone with 911 begging them there is a madman inside the donut shop. Now luckily, since this is a small town, the police station was only about two minutes away from me, so help did arrive fairly quickly, though honestly it seemed like an eternity. Anyway, the man had exited the store when police arrived, but luckily they were able to apprehend him just a couple of minutes later, as they found him in the alleyway behind the donut shop. In summary, the guy was on drugs, as I had predicted, and was in no way coherent of where he was or what he was doing. I'd heard he was jailed, but he was let out a short time later. I quit just a few weeks after that incident, and after another month or so of summer break, I proceeded to attend community college before moving to California to get my degree at a university in finances. A life has since treated me fairly well with a decent paying job a beautiful wife and two lovely daughters who I just introduced your channel to. They really like the animation stuff you're doing, and I picked up a couple of stickers for them which they put on their binders for school. So hey, some free advertising for your animation. Anyway, that's my story submission. I'm really hoping you'll get more of your subscribers to send in their stories, as I love sitting down with my coffee and listening to these podcasts. Stay safe, creepy fox as well as to my fellow Creepy Fox listeners. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to hit that like button and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. And subscribe and turn on notifications if you're brand new. Also, make sure to check out our song, Make a Start. You can find it on Apple Music, Spotify, or even here on YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel and check it out underneath the Creepy Fox topic section. Also, consider grabbing some Creepy Fox merchandise, which you can see right below the video. And if you want early access to brand new videos with no advertisements, as well as exclusive narration videos not available to anyone else, consider becoming a channel member. Which, speaking of, I'd like to go ahead and give them all a shout out. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Scott, Sean, Corey, Linz, Maribel, and our newest member, Medu Satel. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the uploads, like, comment, and share them with their family and friends. I appreciate and love every single one of you. Thanks once again for stopping by, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.